gorgeous. And sex is 99% of marriage. At least I'm satisfied on that. I never got stuck on a car I tested out first. He's on his way up. No more scrimping. No more dull job. No more dating to find the right man. If I marry Ray, it'll be a one-way ticket to the top. Uh, what will she do for me? Build me up? Help me get ahead? I need a social asset, not a liability. Oh, I love kids. But I won't love them any less with a maid to wipe their noses and change their diapers. Marriage needs two things. Sex and a successful career. Now, sex is okay, but what's she gonna do for my career? Yeah, I love her. If you're going to fall in love, it might just as well be with a rich man as a poor one. I love him. Insight. An exploration in depth of the spiritual conflicts of the 20th century. Insight. How do you do? I'm Father Kaiser. The couple in today's program are faced with a decision, one of the most important they'll ever make. A decision faced sooner or later by almost every member of the human race. Whether or not to marry, when to marry, who to marry. To make this decision wisely, they must know themselves, and they must know the person they plan to marry. What can they expect from marriage? What will marriage demand from them? From the outside so often, marriage looks like a continuation of courtship, a blissful state of mutual satisfaction. You're attracted to her, she's attracted to you. You're made for each other. It's all very simple. She has what you need, you have what she needs. It's a very convenient relationship. No problems, no difficulties. You'll live happily ever after. So I'd look to Ray and Sandra as they face the big decision. Anne? Are you just on your way to dinner? This is Sandy. I bet you'll never guess where I'm phoning from. The Golden Gothic. Yes, really. Well, I was just having lunch with Ray. I, I mean, dinner. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Anne, I wish you'd... Yes, he's the fellow that you introduced me to at the blind date two months ago. I wish you'd stop treating men like there's something you pick up on an assembly belt. Well, well, anyway, listen. I bet you'll never guess what I've got on third finger left hand. Well, of course from Ray. Well, who else do I know who could afford a rock like that? Well, after all, honey, he's, he's only been out of college for two years, and he's already earning $750 a month. And last week he got a raise, and his boss is already calling him by his first name. He says in two years or, or less, we'll be living in a house in Brentwood or Bel Air. Oh, well, well, of course we'll start in an apartment, but it'll be a modern one with everything built in. Except my father running around in his T-shirt and, and mom and her curlers in that hallway that hasn't been painted since the year one. Oh, listen, honey, here he comes. I'll call you later. What are you doing, running up my bill? Uh-huh. I don't come to places like this every day, you know. Well, not yet. Only on special occasions. Very, very special. I love you. Oh, it's so beautiful, but it's so extravagant. Yeah, it's only money. My girl deserves the best. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I want to tell everybody. Who is that on the phone, anyway? It was Anne. Anne? Anne who? Oh, honey. She only introduced us. I work with her. Oh, yes, I remember. It's a nice girl. Is she a close friend of yours, or...? Mm-hmm. I see. Well, I only ask because, uh, well, she is. She's very sweet, but she doesn't seem like she's gonna fit in with the crowd that we'll be moving with. You know, the executives and well, their wives. Uh, my salary would hardly pay the perfume bills for some of those gals. Yeah, but do you think we're going to fit in with people like that? Are you kidding? In a couple of years, we'll be there. You'll have more mink and perfume than they have. I'm on the way up, honey. Really. One of the vice presidents is, uh, he's got an opening for an assistant, and the word is that I'm next in line. Boy, our wedding reception's gonna be a bang-up affair. Very, very impressive. You'll wear one of your slinky dresses, and we'll wow the brass at the office. But, you know, my, uh, my parents have to pay for all that. They can't afford a big show. Oh, are you kidding? No, no, they'll pay for the wedding and a little reception, you know, at home, coffee cake, and old friends and everything. No, the big affair will be downtown later. We'll take a bank room, one of the big hotels. Yeah, all the guys from the office will be there, and 
Don't think we invented money. And can we afford that, Ray? Well, my mom and dad want to send her a present. You know, I'll, I'll ask for cash. Mm -hmm. And we will live happily ever after in an apartment where all I have to do is push buttons and watch things go. Well, housework ought to be automatic. It's anti-romance. You know, I... I think with you around, I'm going to have to learn to do things the easy way. My dear, the easy way is the easiest thing anybody ever learned. Ray and Sandra are in many ways typical of many young couples. They begin their marriage with tremendous hopes and unlimited expectations. And yet so often their older and wider friends watch them walk down the aisle, wipe the tears from their eyes and say, if it could only last. In a way, these people are right. The emotional radiance, the starry-eyed exuberance of the honeymoon period can't last. Yet in another way, these people are wrong. The love of the young couple for each other can last. So can their happiness. As the years pass and the couple grow into maturity, their love for each other can become richer and fuller. But only if their love is realistic. Only if their love is ready for responsibility. Only if their love is rooted in God. Love gives to man and woman their greatest happiness. And yet in the concrete, Love always involves sacrifice. It requires that both parties give of themselves until it hurts, and sometimes beyond. Sacrifice is never easy for a human being. That's the paradox. We find our greatest happiness only by forgetting about ourselves and seeking the happiness of someone else. Some couples learn only the hard way from bitter experience that the true measure of love, the true goal of it, the true joy of it, is not getting but giving. Well, I've been right here, Anne. I don't know why you didn't get me. Oh. Maybe I was at the market. It's the only place I ever get to anymore. Regularly. Oh, well. Yeah, I had to change ears. Well, tell me, where did you go this time? Hong Kong. Oh, how exciting. Well, of course I envy you. Married to a to a big, successful executive. No, listen, you better not come by this afternoon. Well, I'm dying to hear about it, but, well, this place takes a lot of cleaning, and today is D-Day. Besides that, I've got the washing and the, you know, the beds, and my favorite form of artistic expression, making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for three screaming hyenas. Well, tell me, what else have you and Bill been up to? Oh, you are? Together? <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to try painting. Ray! Oh, sure we do. Oh, yeah, you know, one night I watch TV while uh, he does the bookkeeping. And then another night, uh, he watches TV while I mend the kids' clothes. Oh, we do loads of things together like that. No, no. No, we haven't had an argument. <laughs> Nothing that exciting. That report is not in the Argus construction file. But I think I can run it down in a few minutes. Can't you file anything where it belongs? Funny. Rudeness seems to destroy my memory. Mm hmm? I'm sorry. Long on work and short on temper. Now that sounds like a motto. You must be an ex-Boy Scout. Ex-fair-haired boy. <laughs> it's a short-lived profession. But everybody outgrows boyhood, fair-haired or otherwise. I feel like an old man these days. You're crotchety enough. Just for that, Miss Simmons, it will give me at this time great pleasure to tell you we're going to work late tonight. A few years ago, that would have been a great tragedy, but right now, it means a few extra bucks in the pay envelope. Listen, we're both beat. Let's take an hour off. Let's grab a steak. On the company. What do you say? Well, now that urgency about the overtime seems to have slowed down to a walk. Well, you may enjoy working on an empty stomach. I don't. I prefer going home. I don't need the money that badly, and I don't think you do either. Oh, come on. What's the rush? Be it ever so humble, I have a home. And I was under the impression that you did too, with three children in it. And a wife? Yes, you better make a note to remind me of that a couple times a day. Or better yet, don't mention it at all. 
Self-pity isn't attractive. Let's cut out the sword play. Both sides of the desk are equal, all right? It's your desk. All right. I'm fed up with it. And my home, and my wife, and I suppose most especially my wife. And what is this, a 1930 movie? Am I supposed to be Joan Crawford? Sexy, efficient, and equipped with a shoulder to cry on? It's not a bad idea. No sarcasm, huh? Okay. I have been working for you since before you got married. That's the year one. And for the first time, I'm worried about you. Now, I know that it is not any of my business, but I am it not... It is your business. I don't have any right to take my personal grievances out on you, but I do it, don't I? Day after day. And putting up with it is my business. But if you want to talk about your private irritations, it's your business. Okay. In the first place, I feel like I've painted myself into a corner in this organization. Nine years ago, I was being groomed for a vice presidency, and here we are again, folks, still being groomed, this time for overtime. <laughs> you are maudlin. You want to know something? There comes a time in every man's life when he has got to face the fact that the sky is not the limit. My limit seems to be somewhat the sight of success. And you do not know when you're well off. There's a lot bigger brass who would be very happy to change places with you. Wonderful. Name me three. One, and give me a phone number. I've seen your home. There are a lot of people who would think that you have a GI mortgage on two stories of paradise. You have a wife, a lovely wife, three children who adore you. But you've got something more, something very, very special. A private world. When you leave this rat race in the afternoon, you've got a refuge to go to. And there are four particular human beings who are there waiting for you just to make it, just that. A refuge. It's more like an armed camp. The second I walk in the door, Sandra shoes the kids off the bed because uh, she wants to be finished so she can sit down and rest. That's sit down and glare at me. You have that effect on me sometime, too. We don't go out at all because of the kids. We can't even talk. I haven't had a decent conversation with her in five years. It takes two to make a conversation, unless uh, you mean dictation. Oh, she tells me a lot of things, facts. How many diapers she had to wash, and several thrilling statistics about uh, the price of lettuce, how often the kids give her a hard time. All the invitations she has to turn down because she hasn't got anything to wear. Lively, rewarding stuff like that. She'll do a good half hour at the drop of a hat on why I haven't fixed the attic window. And what do you talk about, work? Well, if I try to change the subject, I'm assaulted with tears. We don't fight, we figuratively stand back to back and pace away from each other. <laughs> Well, I'm beginning to feel just like dear Abby. But, do you love your wife? Miss Simmons, there's one sure and certain way for a woman to force a man to stop loving her, and that's to complain and insist that he doesn't. You ever tell her you do? Oh, I... Uh, officially, I am uh, an old maid. But, uh, I was in love once. Unfortunately, it had uh, an end almost before the beginning. A bitter, petty end. After that, another love just didn't seem to be worth the trouble. The ending began when we started demanding from one another and not giving to one another. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll get back to the Argus file before I start crying all over your kid's picture. Talk? 
about what? Oh, I don't know. Anything that uh, comes into your pretty little head. Anything except the same old gripes over and over again. Like a phonograph record. That doesn't make you a conversationalist. Thanks. And slumping in front of the TV set with your eyes half closed doesn't make you a great lover either. Yeah, well, lovemaking is for people in love, right? Happy. It doesn't uh, exactly describe you and me. No. Enough martini for me? Mm-hmm. You'll have to get another glass. Do you want some crackers? Well, then I'll share this one. We can still share a glass, at least, can we? <laughs> Quite a come down. A box of crackers, a few sterile words. That's the way things end. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Boy, it really is over, isn't it? Why, Ray? Is it my fault? I don't know. You want a divorce? What about the children? I don't know that either. What about you? What about me? That matter. I never wanted anybody else, Sandy. I uh, swear that. For the last couple of years, you, you haven't quite wanted me either. Funny, isn't it? And, and we started out with such great hopes. And you wound up a housewife. You want to call it a day? Not much else we can do, is there? Well, no, I'll sleep here like I can find somewhere. Ray, you don't hate me, do you? It'd be a lot easier if I did. I don't hate you. Good, I'll hold the thought. Always half empty, never half full. I don't think there's anything so sad in all the world as the breakup of a home. Two lives are uprooted and torn apart. The security of the children is shattered. It's a human tragedy of tremendous import. But why did Ray and Sandra fail? They seem like so many others. What went wrong with their marriage? I think Ray and Sandra failed not because they expected great things from marriage, but because they expected the wrong things. Both of them entered marriage for reasons which, at least in part, must be called selfish. For marriage, she expected financial security and status. She married him, at least in part, because he could give her the material things she always wanted. His motives seem at least as selfish. He wanted approval and glamour. He looked upon her as a social asset and a means of sexual fulfillment. Neither of them was primarily concerned with what they could give to their marriage, but rather with what they could get from it. Neither chose the other for his own sake, but each used the other for his own gratification. Even under ideal circumstances, Ray and Sandra were sure to be disappointed. But given the less than ideal circumstances, they were forced to face the facts about their marriage. They were not getting what they expected. And because they were not, they decided to call it quits. They did, that is until they began to consider the consequences of their decision. Well, that's it. Got everything? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm missing a couple of the good shirts. Well, I'll send them on to you when they get back from the laundry. You lost a little weight. That's easy. Just stop eating. It looks good. Feels wonderful. Yeah. Well, I'm 
supposed to talk to your attorney on Monday. There's no point in putting it off, I guess. So long. Oh, uh, what was that address where you're staying? Oh, uh, Garden City Apartments. I don't know the number. It's on Wilshire. Well, what is it? A motel or what? Doesn't matter. It sounds like a motel to me. It is. It's a party every night. Booze in the swimming pool, everything. A thrill a minute. It's a Playboy penthouse. Bunnies running in and out. It's a room, Sandy. What do you want me to tell you? Nice, comfortable room. Desk, TV set. Has a bed in it. Sensational bed. Bed's got a lot of class. You can sit on it. Lay down flat, look at the ceiling. For hours on end, you can stare at the ceiling from this bed. Turn on your side and look at the wall. That's good for a couple hours. Sleeping is out. It's not that kind of bed, but the thinking is very great. Not only for quality, but for sheer volume. It has to be the greatest thinking bed of all time. Then I have a, a lamp. I need that so I can turn it on to read my bill when it comes each week. That's my mail. Naomi wrote you a letter. Didn't you get it? No, not there. She sent it to the office. How the kids making out, anyway? Oh, they're right out in the backyard. Why don't you go ask them? No, I've seen them. You have? When? Well, I drove by the school. Looked through the fence. They didn't see me. Ray, why don't you walk out in the backyard? Talk to them, at least. Can't take it, huh? I guess not. Well, I look at them every day, all day long, and they look at me. This morning, when I woke up, I found them. Both of them, hand in hand, Ray, standing at the foot of my bed, watching me while I slept. Naomi blames me for everything that's happened. No, she doesn't. It's not your fault anyway. I walk, and Naomi knows it. You're very smart kids, honey. They're hard to fool. That's the letter that she sent me at the office. Read it. She made that. Well, they've, they've got a thing in there, fourth grade class, where they make their own stationery. Open it and read it. Dear Daddy, when I was a child, I went downtown with my mother to her beauty shop. She got a haircut. Gave me some. I keep it. She has beautiful hair. Smells sweet. Don't you think so, too? Yes, I do, Sandy. I think so, too. Ray, please come home. I don't know where I am without you. I don't know what to do. It's pointless, honey, to start over. If it's going to be from the same place. Honey, it's not the same. It's never the same once you're married. Like it or not, happy or not, there's a bond there. I can feel it. I can't break it, not with 20 divorce courts or a dozen lawyers. All right, I'll buy that for an opener. But let's be realistic. What do we want? What do we have? We had something. But I, for one, didn't appreciate it. I, I, I don't care. I don't care about anything as long as we're together. Now, wait a minute. If you think this thing through, if your back is to the wall, if you're lost, if you don't have any choice but to follow it through step by step, you will find only love counts. If you're not willing to love, uh, to give yourself, you're nowhere. You've got nothing, nothing at all. Love means uh, unselfishness. Means giving without worrying about what you're going to get in return. So 
subordinating your own ego, your own desires, your own pleasure to something that's bigger and better than you are. That's different. I never thought I'd ever hear you say that. Well, it costs, honey. Wiping up uh, orange juice off the kitchen floor and changing diapers and giving them discipline, because not giving it is the easy way, costs a lot when you total it up over a lifetime. Ray, I'm sorry I was so selfish. I, I, I only want you. I don't want some hot shot or, or the richest guy in the world. That's nothing to love. But you are. Well, that's good because I'm never going to be any of those things, honey. I know that now. And I don't even care. That's not a cop-out. That's a fact. It's a relief, one of many I found on my ceiling. I love you. And... I don't need to drown you in perfume and mink to appreciate you. Well, I... I better get something for the kids to wear in the morning. Let them wait. They have a lot longer to wait than we do. It has taken the anguish of separation and the fear of divorce to strip the blinders from the eyes of Ray and Sandy. Now, for the first time in a long time, they're beginning to see each other not only as an economic provider, an object of sexual desire, or a vehicle for the achievement of status, but now they say in each other a human personality of infinite value because etched in the image and likeness of God. A creature of such tremendous value that it can only be loved for its own sake and never used for selfish gratification. Every marriage has its problems. No two people are perfectly matched. Yet I think the vast majority of these problems can be solved if both husband and wife will sacrifice their own selfish desires in the interest of that deeper and wider life they are to have in common. The secret of happiness in marriage comes down to one word. That word is love. A love that draws the couple together and enables them to find God in each other. A love that expresses itself in generosity and self-sacrifice. A love that finds revitalization in children. A love so strong that it binds the couple together, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, until death do them part. A love that sweeps them together into the very arms of God himself. Insight is a production of the Paulist Fathers, a group of Catholic priests who served their God by serving those outside their church.